here's what we got for the day. If we were in class, we'd actually decorate some cookies like the brain. Um, this class, does anybody need to make up the test? I feel like this hour, everybody had the test in, so nobody needs to make it. Kudos to you guys. Um, thank you very much. We're going to talk about the outer brain today. And um, this is, again, still part of chapter seven in your textbook. And then in our flex time, we're going to do test corrections. And I will explain those to you when we get there. OK, any questions on agenda? It's pretty simple. So here's um, today we're just going to talk about the outer brain. Monday, we'll talk about the inner brain. So obviously, the parts that you can see without making any cuts, um, that is the outer brain. So we should be able to identify the regions and what they do. So everything we do, like pretty much every lecture, is identifying pieces and parts and what they do, right? Um, so we're talking about the cerebral hemispheres, brain stem, and cerebellum. So we should be able to talk about those structures and what they do, as well as um, the features that the brain has to protect itself. So external layers like the meninges and um, the cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. I put this student version in there. I didn't make a copy for everybody because I think a lot of people probably don't use it. But if you'd like to use it, you are welcome to make your own copy and then you'll be able to write on it on your own. <clears throat> so um, the brain starts to develop about three weeks after conception and um, it's creating 250 thousand neurons per minute during early pregnancy. That is a huge number. It's kind of impressive. At birth, almost all the neurons you'll ever have have already been developed. So about 100 billion, a billion neurons. Um, and your brain will only be about the quarter size of the adults. So we have room left to grow. Um, by the time you're five, your brain has already expanded in size to the majority of its size. So about 90%. So kids maybe look like they got a big head compared to their body size. Um, and this is due to the growth of dendrites. So I was explaining um, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about reflexes and that um, with practice, those dendrites grow and they close the gap between synapses, right? And that's basically what, what learning is. So as you're learning, whether it's content or just life or how to walk or anything, um, the cells, the dendrites are growing. Um, you're adding dendrites to the cell body and then they're extending beyond. And that's where the growth of the brain is actually taking place. Um, and that's what I was saying earlier is that basically you're closing the synapses. So you're making connections between cells to create pathways to find information, basically. Um, the brain has a number of things for protection. We're going to identify three. The first one is the cerebral spinal fluid. So the blue here in this picture is the cerebral spinal fluid. So it is continuous with the um, spinal cord as well. So it goes down into your vertebrae. Uh, one thing it does is act as a shock absorber. So like if you, you know, get hit or something in the head and your brain moves forward, it's gonna be a shock absorber that kind of cushions the blow before it hits the skull. So we have that. We also have that it's protecting from um, bacteria because we have antibodies that circulate in the fluids of our tissues. And, um, and so there we can find antibodies as well. The skull acts like a helmet, a hard outer covering. That would make sense. And then meninges are like membranous layers that cover the skull. Um, the outermost layer is the dura mater. It's a tough, almost like a sac that the brain is in. You can cut and remove the dura mater from the brain. So it's not connected um, entirely. Then there's a second layer under that, and I'll show you a picture on the next page. A second layer under that, and that's the arachnoid, um, meaning spider-like, because it has lots of extensions coming down underneath it that look like a spider web. Um, and then you find your cerebral spinal fluid underneath there. And then finally, 
your pia matter is like directly fused to the brain. So if we were in a lab, you would try to see if you could separate that pia matter from the brain tissue and you would not be able to. It's, it's fused with it. But these are three extra layers. Um, you might have heard of like meningitis, inflammation of the meninges. And so that's what it's referring to, those outer, outer coverings. So this is your brain here. This very thin layer, pia means delicate. Um, so this first layer that's directly connected goes down into the grooves and everything of the brain. That is the pia matter. The arachnoid, you can see how it has its webbing extending beneath it. So that's the arachnoid, the second one. Um, this is where you find your cerebral spinal fluid circulating within that sub below, sub arachnoid space. Dura, durable, very thick, tough outer covering, the dura matter, and then you have your skull. Um, and then the rest of that has to do with other tissue. Like we, we've talked about periosteum um, that covers bones and uh, the skin, but those aren't necessarily protect, protecting the skull. They're just part of the overall anatomy. I mean, protecting the brain. So from the bone down, that's your protective layers. Okay. PAD, P-A-D. On the test, I ask you to label them or identify them in sequence. We've seen a lot of sequencing questions. So identifying them either deepest um, to most superficial or superficial to deep. Right, so P-A-D or D-A-P, okay? So, um, so obviously the brain is the largest, most complex mass of nervous tissue. It weighs about four kilograms, which I think is like 2.2 .2 pounds or something. Is that right? Um, the cerebral hemisphere, this is the outer portion here, the yellow. So it's, it's basically what you probably think of as the brain is gonna be the cerebral hemisphere. It's the outer layer. Diencephalon, we'll talk about Monday. That's the inner portion. So this right here, this purple part, that's the diencephalon. Um, that's gonna control a lot of our autonomic things. The brain stem here connects the brain to the spinal cord has three components. We'll talk about that today. And then the cerebellum looks like a little cauliflower hanging out at the bottom of the cerebrum. And um, Sophie identified that's for balance. So good job. So those are the structures. Um, today, we're just talking about the outer portions. Uh, first of all, we want to identify that if you looked at a brain, you would notice there's some gray matter and some white matter. And maybe you don't know they're called gray matter and white matter, but you can see that they're different colors right? And, um, and so that is the gray and the white matter. The gray is basically the cell bodies. And then the white is that myelinated portion. So last chapter, we talked about the myelin sheaths, and we talked about them being made from either Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes. And oligodendrocytes are in the um, central nervous system, right? So this is going to be oligodendrocyte Schwann's or um, myelin matter, basically. So the white matter is the nerve bundles, the cords, basically. And um, the gray matter is going to be the cellular component. That's your metabolic. So then you have some features of the brains. We see that it's all folded up. So that's the sulcus and the gyrus. The sulcus are the shallow grooves. They dip down in here, dip down in here. See the dips? And then the gyrus are the ridges, the bumps on top. And the purpose of that is to increase surface area. So like, remember I just said the, the outer layer is where the, the work is happening basically. Okay, so all the chemical reactions are gonna happen on this surface. And if I can only fit this much in my area, I can only do that much work. But if I fold this up, you could imagine I have room for a couple more pages worth of work in that same space. So that's the whole reason for the folding of the brain. It increases surface area so that there can be a lot more reactions taking place. So on the test, you're going to want to know the difference between a gyrus and a sulcus. Gyrus is the ridges and sulcus is the shallow grooves. Fissures also exist. Fissures are deeper. 
Um, so you can see like here we have grooves, but now look, boom, this like valley, right? So the valleys are going to be um, your fissures. So we can see this lateral fissure right here or longitudinal fissure, sorry. We can see a horizontal fissure, fissure here. So we'll see those on the next slide. So down the middle, separating the right and left halves, you have the longitudinal fissure between the right and left halves. Central sulcus separates the basically the front portion of the brain and the second portion of the brain. This is going to come into play when we start talking about specific parts of the brain do specific things. So we're going to definitely want to know about the central sulcus. And then the lateral um, sulcus, this again is a fissure because it's deep. Basically, the fissures are going to separate lobes. So it separates the temporal lobe from the parietal lobe, the frontal lobe. Okay, so those are fissures, they're deeper. So think of the cerebral hemispheres as the outer portion. The diencephalon is what's on the inside. So the outer portion, that's your consciousness. So anything that you consciously control that's happening on this surface, right? Um, so speech, memory, logical, and emotional responses, consciousness, being awake or not, interpretation, sensation, um, and voluntary movement, those are all part of your conscious being, and they're controlled on the outer portion of your brain. So this is the largest piece of your brain, and you can consider it the most superficial. So cerebellum down here in the back. That's your next largest piece. So you can see the cerebrum is the majority. You have a good vision of the longitudinal fissure here, separating the um, two hemispheres. Okay, so today we'll talk about the lobes of the brain and they're named according to the bone that is covering them. So the frontal lobe is covered by the frontal bone. The occipital lobe is covered by the occipital bone. Temporal, temporal, parietal, parietal. You get it. So um, these are all named according to the bones. You've already learned those. So this should be pretty easy. So now you just have to learn what they do. So the parietal lobe, which is behind the central sulcus. This is my central sulcus. So the parietal lobe is this section in blue, both dark and light. It allows you to recognize pain, coldness, or a light touch. Basically, this is our sensory cortex, sensations. The occipital lobe in the back, this is for vision. So I think information goes straight back from my eyes to my occipital lobe, which isn't entirely true, but it helps me remember where it's at. Um, the temporal lobe, what do I have here? My ears. So that's part of hearing, as well as the sense of smell. So your olfactory bulb, um, the nerve goes right back to your temporal lobe. The frontal lobe, this is the important piece. This does so much, um, allows us conscious movement. So that's right here in the motor cortex in front of the central sulcus. Um, it allows us to talk. Um, the actual physical movement of creating words is in the temporal. Making sense of those words, understanding what those words mean, that's temporal. I think I think I said temporal when I was pointing at my frontal. Um, so being able to form words is frontal. Understanding is temporal. Um, so in this portion of the brain, you have what's called the Broca's area, and that's usually considered your speech cortex. Um, your higher level thinking, critical thinking, doing well on the test, looking for information from the test, all that happened yesterday in the frontal lobe. So the right and the left, they need to coordinate, right? Because like my right part of my brain takes care of my left body, my left part of my brain takes care of my right body. They're connected by um, this thick portion here called the corpus callosum. So this is a whole bunch of nerve fibers, 200 million different nerve fibers all combined together into one big thick cord. And it connects um, 
the right and left halves, allowing them to communicate with each other. You've probably heard like your left side is analytical and your right side is artistic, right? So if we can connect um, the two sides together, then we have better understanding. The posterior um, of our spinal cord brings information up. So remember, we talked afferent and efferent last chapter or last section. So the afferent information, like sensory information, is going to come up our backside to our post central gyrus. This is our sensory cortex that we saw on the last slide. It jumps over the central sulcus, comes down the precentral gyrus, our motor cortex down the front side of our spinal cord. So that is how information is traveling, up the back, down the front. So posterior is arrivals and anterior are exits. Going back up here, information comes up the back of the spinal cord through the temporal lobe, actually through the diencephalon in the middle, but we don't see that yet. Primary, cell, um, primary sensory cortex over the central sulcus back down the motor cortex and then down the front. So if you had injuries to the backside, you would have trouble getting information to the brain. Perhaps you wouldn't have feeling. If you had injury to the front of the brain, you would have trouble carrying out response. I'm sorry, injury to the front of the spinal cord. You'd have trouble carrying out response. Okay, so that's the central sulcus and the corpus callosum. The cellular vellum here, our coordinating piece, um, second largest portion of the brain. To me, it looks like a cauliflower. It has that same folding appearance as the brain itself. This is involved with muscle coordination. So getting things to work together at the same time. Like you're dancing right now. <laughs> your cerebellum is connecting your head and your neck and your shoulders and your body together to make a fluid movement. If you play an instrument, like we have to move different fingers to create a different sound, right? To hit a different note. Getting these fingers to work together, that's your cerebellum. In the high jump, I had to do a number of movements at exact right timing. That's all going to be our cerebellum. So muscle coordination and balance and equilibrium. Okay, so biggest piece, the cerebellum, the cerebrum, this next biggest piece, cerebellum, and then the brain stem connects the brain to the spinal cord with three pieces, the midbrain, which is reflex centers related to vision and hearing. Um, so like when you want to look at something up close, you're going to pull this ciliary body inside your eyes, are going to pull on your lens to create focus, right? So that, that would be like a reflex related to vision, is adapting for far and near. The pons, this middle piece, so if we were doing a dissection, you would look for this bump. This big bump is the pons, and then there's another bump that's the medulla. So the pons is mostly fiber tracks, just information coming and going related to the control of breathing. And then finally, the medulla oblongata. This is like when you go in and you get all your vital measurements. Um, this is in control of heart rate, blood pressure, breathing. You can see this would be a big factor of sympathetic, um, swallowing and vomiting reflexes. So that's all part of our medulla. Okay, so talking about the brain, you should be able to identify one, two, three, four lobes. You should identify bumps versus grooves. You should identify the central sulcus. I don't really care about the other fissures, but we need the central sulcus so we can talk about the pre and post central gyrus, cerebellum. The three parts of the brainstem, the midbrain pons medulla and cerebellum. Okay. Do you have any questions on parts of the brain? We'll have a labeling quiz next Thursday. We're still going to go inside and label the diencephalon. So we have that yet to come. 
okay? You can keep this practice on your own if you'd like. I wanted to get into what you're gonna do next. You guys all with me? No questions? Okay, so we're gonna do a test analysis. I know a number of people weren't terribly excited about the score they received. So um, you will earn like a half point back if the entire row is complete and correct. So question number whatever, obviously, what I thought I knew. So um, like I thought the astrocytes were the small phagocytic cells. What I know now is basically going to be a corrected version of your question. So you're going to use the question and the answer as your correct statement. So this would be like, now I know um, microglia are small phagocytic cells. Evidence, reasoning behind it, micro means small. So you know that's the small one. Um, some of these are more scientific based. Like if you talked about the action potentials, moving out, moving in of sodium and potassium, you're gonna get into more biological concepts like diffusion, right? So this is the science behind it. And this is really where you earn your points because you can look this up, but I need to see that you understand it, okay? So that is in your Google Classroom. And I gave you, um, I don't know if you guys necessarily see the instructions when you open these things, um, but here's like first, second, third columns. You can access your test in the Illuminate Ed um, student portal. So this is a link. Your test should be available for you to see. And it is available until 1230, I think. So the next two hours that's open. So you can do that and get that done. What questions do you have? 